Hi, welcome. This is the September 2014 all network call from the 52 network. We are a matter of hours away from Wiki 14. We'll be gathering in Katy, Texas. Tuesday on Tuesday at about one o'clock Central Time for Wiki 14. Hard to believe this is already the fourth Wiki conference in the history of the 52 network. There's uh, there's been a lot of great stuff happening across the board in the uh, in the 52 Wiki conference and a an event to top all the rests all the rest of them up to this point. Uh, next Tuesday, starting at, uh, at Crosspoint Community Church in Katy, Texas. Lots of stuff to talk about in uh, this week's uh, or this month's All Network call as well. So in just a moment here, we'll, uh, we'll hear from Bill Woolsey, the founder of 5.2. And coming up in just a few moments, uh, David Schmidt from Concordia Seminary in St. Louis will talk about uh, so, some ways that you can use preaching to deepen your Questions ready? You can tweet them out on Twitter using the hashtag 52Live, hashtag 5, F-I-V-E, the number 2, live, L-I-V-E. That'll be the easiest place for uh, to get your questions in. Or you can also open up the Q&A app inside of the Google Hangout here, and your question will come up uh, automatically right there on the screen, and we'll work through those questions as uh, time allows, as Dr. Sh the impact of your preaching. So that's a that's what you have on tap for uh, this week's uh, this month's all network call from five two. But before we get into the real the real guts, the real the, the real marrow of uh, this month's uh, all network call, let's hear from the founding leader of five two, Bill Woolsey. What are you looking forward to most about next week's wiki conference? Do you think, Bill? Jonathan, thanks for uh, thanks for hosting here today. Thanks for the uh, the softball. Really. The conference is the highlight of the year for me because we gather men and women, sacramental entrepreneur types from around the country, uh, literally from around the world here in good old West Houston. Uh, by the way, it's a little muggy right now, but it's going to be stunning and gorgeous. We just know it next week. But uh, we come together and catch up on one hand. We haven't seen each other, many of us, in a year or even more. But more than that, we spend time uh, sharing some stories and really encouraging one another. Because the fact is that when you are trying to lead your congregation or lead your ministry to reach the lost people in your community, especially by starting new so we can reach new, that is one of the most difficult tasks that you'll ever be faced with as a minister of the gospel. So to come together, pour into each other, uh, laugh together, cry together, pray for each other, and then hear some wonderful teaching from uh, different people in our denomination and other denominations across denominations, uh, it's just a it's just a fantastic time. It's really really the high point of my year, and the people that I talk to who participate they love it as well. So that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'm trying to get the keynote kind of fine tuned here, so that as we we kick off the event on Tuesday afternoon, we kick it off well. We also have an ebook that we are going to be releasing to the conference to all the participants. Ones that we, a book that we know uh, is really going to help uh, those of us who are trying to start strong. Uh, we have some great announcements to make about next year's Wiki Conference. We already have a number of speakers lined up. You're going to love hearing about that. And uh, I just get a chance as well to network with a whole bunch of uh, other networks from around the country. So that's all the stuff that I'm looking forward to. I'm ready for the week, excited to catch back up, and excited to learn more about reaching lost people in the United States. Awesome, awesome. Excited to, uh, to be a part of next, next week's Wiki Conference, Wiki 14, going on at Crosspoint Community Church in uh, Katy, Texas. Now, uh, I, Bill, you, you stole my thunder here because I was going to ask you how the keynote was coming along. So it... Uh, you're at what? You know the 97, 98 percent mark at this point. <laughs> uh, you, you know me. I'm like 98 percent of of uh, mapping it out. Maybe. No, I okay. still, I still have, uh, I still have a little bit of a ways to go. I'll be writing through tonight, uh, tomorrow, and just trying to uh, to make sure that it hangs well. Been praying a lot about this talk. Really have been over the last year. Lots of things have happened in the network. So really kind of seeking what, what God wants me to share with all of those who are gathered. Right on, right on. That's, a, that's, that's the uh, ideal way to, uh, to develop 
a conversation like this. You know, I'm excited to to, to hear some of the announcements about the uh, uh, some of the things that are going on in the network. And uh, I, I have to admit, I, I, I'm I'm a little jumpy because I only know a few of the things that you're going to say. So you you've got some surprises for us. Is is that what I'm hearing? I think so. I, I yeah, I think we have a couple at least that we're pretty excited about. So. Awesome, awesome. Well, that is uh, that is definitely something to uh, to look forward to coming up uh, next week at the 5-2 Wiki Conference in Houston. Lots to be excited about. All right, it is time to dive into the uh, the, the meat of this week's or this month's all network call from 5-2. So we will we will dive into the topic of preaching. Yeah, one of the, that's one of the tracks at the uh, at the five two wiki conference that you can specialize your time. In. So preaching is the focus of this month's all network call. I'm very excited to uh, to welcome uh, Dr. David Schmidt from Concordia Seminary uh, into the conversation at uh, in this month's all network call. He is going to dive into the the topic of meditation and preaching. We're going to look at some of the details of, of how you can really make the most of your conversations with your congregation through preaching, through focusing the attention, energy, and enthusiasm of the congregation on the Word of God. So, Dr. Schmidt, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. It's uh, I, I'm excited that you're inviting me to come to the conference. Uh, it'll be my first one. I'm really looking forward to it. Justin has put together some great stuff and uh, looking forward to meeting people who are uh, creative and engaged. Uh, so this is going to be uh, this is going to be great. The, um, the uh, topic that I'm going to work with is uh, the topic of focusing attention in very particular moments of the sermon on one idea so that it, it touches the head of the people and it touches their heart so that they can understand what you're talking about and that they also care about it. That's really the, the basic skill we're going to look at. I, I like to use a uh, metaphor when I think about preaching and it's a metaphor of a pilgrimage. I think when we're writing a sermon it's kind of like a pilgrimage. We start by reading the text, we meditate on it, we then enter into life experience. We follow our Lord into the world, we're interacting with people, we find ourselves watching things on television, engaged in conversations, working in community activities, and along the way things happen. And uh, because we've got that scriptural text in our mind, because we've got this event we're going to be preaching to people in mind, we start to meditate and see things differently, and, and sometimes some of those moments uh, coalesce around an idea and experience that we want to share on Sunday. I think that when you get to the preaching of them, you also have a pilgrimage that you are taking people through. So rather than you walking through a pilgrimage, you're now leading others through a pilgrimage. You're taking them to moments of of experiences that you had during the week that clarified something for you. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, creating these moments of meditation. Uh, that's what we're going to call the moments of meditation in the sermon. Uh, it's, it'll be a, an, an experience of about two to five minutes in the sermon when you focus the attention of the people upon one main idea and you try to clarify it for their minds and you try to help them care about it in their hearts. And that's what I would call a, a moment of meditation. And I'm going to share with you a, uh, a PowerPoint that works with uh, creating moments of meditation. You'll look at the top of the screen. You're going to see a whole series of methods of development that you can use. And what we're going to do here is we're going to take the idea of hope. So let's say that I, as a preacher, I've encountered a text, and working with that text in the world, following my Lord, I've really come to a deeper understanding of hope. And what I want to do in the sermon is at some point in the sermon, for a period of about three to five minutes, I want to help my hearers focus on the idea of hope. I, as a preacher, would have the ability to use narrative that's tell a story, work with a character, uh, see hope through the lens of a person's life, 
work with serial depiction, give a, a whole series of examples that develop the idea of hope, use an image that evokes hope for God's people, engage in a dialogue with people that centers around hope, enact a moment of hope for God's people, or work with explanation. And so what we're going to do together is we're just simply going to walk through each of these methods of development. I'll give you an example of what it looks like in a, in a sample sermon. And then I will um, then I will talk to you a little bit about uh, how you can uh, theoretically how you can construct it. So for every moment of meditation, the, the first most important thing is that you actually need to say what you want people to think about. <laughs> a lot of times we're thinking of an idea, but we never really clarify it in our language. So at some point, you're going to need to say that idea. It should be short. It should be memorable and it should be simple, okay? And often you're going to say it more than once. So, for example, with our topic of hope, here's what I might say at some point. There's a way of life called hope. God's given it that name. Don't confuse it with what some people would call dreaming, others wishing, others uh, positive inspiration. No, there's a way of life called hope for Christians. It's when a promise of God about your future changes the way you live now. That's a, a little introduction to our main idea. You'll notice I've stated the main idea several times. There's a way of life called hope. And now that I've got that idea clear, I'm going to move into developing it. Hmm. So let's say I'm going to develop it by narrative. I'm going to tell you a story. I could start with the story and then lead you inductively to the teaching of hope. So in the sermon, I tell you a story about a, a couple I know named Bill and Janelle. Uh, they're a, uh, everyone says that they're rather free-spirited. They have a, a lifestyle that's rather free-spirited. Uh, they, they look down on social conventions like marriage and religion. They've been living together and having a great time. Uh, the only thing is that suddenly God has done something in their life that's going to change things. He's brought a, a baby into their life. Not a baby as you and I think about a baby that is a, a, a healthy young boy wrapped in blue blankets. No, for everything that the tests say, this child's going to be a Down syndrome child. And Bill and Janelle have been faced with people who've told them that they should possibly abort this child. Why bring a child like that into this world? But for some reason, they've kind of reached back into their memory of their church as kids, and they see this child as a gift from God. And that changes things for them. They've gotten involved in a uh, early intervention program with Easter Seals that was hosted by a congregation. Uh, they met a woman named Joy uh, through that Easter Seals program. Joyce uh, invited them to a, a, a small group with her. And they're beginning to talk with a pastor about possibly getting married. And suddenly, suddenly their life is changing. Uh, I think you could say what is happening in their life is that they are beginning to live a life called hope. It's a name that God has given it. It's uh, not wishing, it's not dreaming, it's not positive anticipation. No, it's a way of life called hope where something that God will do in your future affects the way you live now. So that's an example of a rhetorical moment of meditation, trying to take the idea of hope and unpack it for people through a narrative. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the theory. I think you should have a handout on uh, narratives and the way this would work as a, as a method of communication. Yes, that, that's right. You do have the handout here available in, the, in the, what they call the showcase area of the Google Hangout. Look for the little things that look like uh, uh, tags, you know, three or four tags. They're yellow, and it'll show up on, uh, on this side of your screen when your uh, when your uh, when, when that showcase area is open, you can click on that and it'll download right to your computer. You can uh, grab a hold of those particular materials and almost follow along at home as Dr. Schmidt unpacks the various pieces of the uh, uh, of the overall process. So take a look at the uh, showcase tab in your Google Hangout, and you'll be able to download the handout that's a part of this particular 5.2 All Network call. 
Okay, so here we have the folders. So during the week I've been meditating. I remembered the story of Bill and Janelle, so I have a folder. There's a picture of this uh, baby. And when you're working with narrative, I think the main thing to realize is that there's going to be a conflict resolution in the story that you tell. So in this particular case, the conflict is whether or not to keep this child. Uh, some have advised them not to keep the child because of its, uh, the child has Down syndrome. And the uh, resolution to that conflict is that they have decided to keep the child because they think of the child as a gift from God. So the first point is, as you're looking at narrative, understand what the conflict is and what the resolution is. Why is this important? Because whatever brings about that resolution is going to be the main idea people walk away with. The climax of the storyline is going to reinforce the main idea. Now, in this particular case, the climax is that they see this child as a gift from God. And that changes everything. That brings them into a way of life called hope. It's important that your main idea be associated with the climax, because otherwise you're going to be saying one thing and your story is going to be teaching something else. And usually the story is going to win. So you want to know what your conflict resolution is. You want to know what the climax is and think about how does that climax relate to my main teaching. And then also two other things about the details you tell. Uh, your details should be concrete so that it's, uh, it evokes a real-life experience. In this case, I talked about an early intervention program with Easter Seals, a small group at the church, a woman named Joy that they met. These concrete details make it, uh, evokes real life for them. But you also want your details to be purposeful. You don't want to include so many details that people kind of lose the story in the midst of all of the details. So when you're working with narrative, uh, you're going to use a, uh, use a narrative to develop your main idea and um, allow those details allow those details to evoke a real life experience that leads people to the teaching. So let's try a second method, and the second method would work by character. And character is going to focus on an experience, but it's really going to be through the lens of a person who, who uh, lived that experience. My rhetorical unit could go something like this. He came to a well to draw water. It was not a moment of rest and relaxation. It was work, hard work. Hard work made harder by the burdens she carried, by the men she had known, or, or I guess you could say the men who had known her, had taken from her, had used her, and then dismissed her with uh, certificates of divorce. In fact, she had known so many men that the man she now knew wouldn't even give her the honor of being called her husband. He was just one more man in a line of men who had taken from her, left her, and left her looking a little bit less human in her own eyes and in the eyes of others. So she came to a well to draw water, but what she really needed, what she really needed was a word that would give her life. And then a man came who asked her for some water. And in that question, she met Jesus. And it's kind of hard to, to give a name to what happened to her there. Because as she talked to him, she met a man who didn't take. No, he was a man who gave. Who gave her a vision of a future kingdom that was coming into her life now. Who gave her a vision of what it was like to be a child of God. And she just, uh, she changed as a person. She left her a water jar there at the well. She ran into the, into the village. The people that she was trying to avoid, suddenly she's trying to find them and meet with them. The, the details about her life that she wouldn't share. Now she's publicly saying, this man told me everything that I ever did. And she's inviting these men to meet Jesus. It's, uh, it's amazing. It's hard to think of a word to describe what happened to her life. I think you could say it, it might be hope. You know, there is a way of life called hope. God's given it that name. Don't confuse it with wishing or dreaming or positive thinking. No, for the Christian, there's a way of life called hope. It's when a, a promise of what God will do for you in the future changes the way that you live now. So that's an example of a second rhetorical unit, working with the idea of hope. You heard me state the main idea, but this time I'm working with character. So if you look at that handout, um, 
we can talk about working with character. And uh, these are the things you'll want to keep in mind when you're working with character. The value of character is that it gives you a personal, ex a personal perspective. People like people. And so as you're working with character, you want to begin to describe not just an event that's happening, but the emotional experience of the person who's participating in that event. So what you do for your people is you evoke for them a living witness of an event. We, we, uh, sometimes we think of scripture as narrating history for us. I think we could also think of scripture as introducing us to people, people who God has brought into a chorus of witnesses who talk about his work in the world. When you're working with character, just like narrative, there's usually going to be some type of change, some movement from conflict to resolution. But the, the important thing to think about is, in character, you're going to want to think about what's happening to the person that you're focus on, focusing on in the story. And usually there's two different ways that things will happen with this person. On the one hand, the person themselves can change. So in this particular case, the woman at the well changes. She goes to the well less than human because of the way these men have treated her, and she walks away from the well fully human because of the way our Lord has treated her. Now there's an event that happens out in the world, that's the event of meeting Jesus at the well, but what is more important in character is the event that happens inside the person this personal transformation that happens to this woman. In other stories, you're going to find that there isn't going to be a personal transformation as much as there's going to be personal stability in the face of external change. So you're going to find somebody like Stephen who is being tested and ultimately is martyred for the faith, and yet he remains stable, he remains constant, he remains faithful in the midst of a lot of conflict. So when working with character, you're offering a personal ex perspective, a living witness of an event, and you're either showing people how an experience of God's work in the world has changed a person, or how an experience of conflict and stress in the world has only reinforced a person's uh, experience and, and faith in God. So that would be the uh, next method. I think we'll do one more, and then I think uh, we might be at a point ready for a break. But the, uh, the next one would be to work with serial depiction. Serial depiction is going to give people a series of examples uh, that show this, um, show this teaching in small moments or small glimpses and gives you a, a broader perspective of how it appears in many places in the world. So here's what that might sound like. There's a way of life called hope. God has given it that name. Don't confuse it with what some people call dreaming or wishing or positive thinking. No, for Christians, there's a way of life called hope. It's when a promise that God makes about the future changes the way you live now. And hope has a way of reaching across generations. Uh, Joyce uh, emails her granddaughter, Jamie, at college once a week. Joyce would actually like to call her, but every time she calls Jamie, it's never a good time, and Jamie never really gets back to her. And Jamie has said, why don't you just text me? But Joyce says the phone is too small and her eyes are not good enough. So what Joyce has done is she's actually gotten a computer. She's 83, gotten a wireless network set up, and she emails Jamie once a week, and once a week, Jamie usually emails her back. And why does she do this? Well, because when Jamie went away to college, she went away from home, but she also went away from her church. And Joyce is thinking that when people uh, leave the church and they're no longer seeking the church, well, maybe the church should start seeking them. And so once a week, she emails Jamie, writes just uh, what's going on in her life, but she always includes something about faith, nothing spectacular, just something simple, something about the way faith is at work in her life. And she does this because she hopes that God's word will bring a change in the life of Jamie. So hope can reach across generations, and it can also reach across cultures. Uh, Jim teaches an ESL class at his church. It's actually the only thing that goes on in the church during the week. Uh, the church is in a part of the city where everything has changed. Most of the members live outside of the suburbs, 
And the people who live around the church, it's a Vietnamese community. They don't speak English, and the people in the church don't speak Vietnamese. But once a week, Jim stays late at work. On the way home, he stops at the church, and on Wednesday night, he has an ESL class for some Vietnamese immigrants. He talks with people named In He and My Lee, and once a week, they read English from verses from Scripture, and Jim does it because he's hoping that they'll learn more than English. He's hoping that they'll learn of their Savior, and they'll learn of this church as a place that they can call home. Hope can reach across generations, it can reach across cultures, it can reach across a dinner table to an estranged child, son, or daughter. There is a way of life called hope, and that way of life is reaching out to bring others into the kingdom. So that's an example of a serial depiction, and in that particular case, you'll, uh, if you look at the handout, you'll notice uh, the value of serial depiction. The serial depiction, you're offering people a series of examples. This is more than a one-sentence summary. I've uh, heard preachers who do serial depiction, and they just give you a one-sentence snapshot. It actually is a little bit longer than that, so you've got a little depth to it, but it's not as long as a full-fledged narrative. The value of it is you can cover a wide range of experiences. You can show how this teaching occurs in different ways in life, uh, but the main idea is that you want to purposefully sequence these examples. So in this particular case, you'll notice how we talked about reaching across generations and then reaching across cultures and then reaching across the table. And I could have added another story uh, about uh, hope reaching across the table at home, uh, but I just cut it out to keep it a little bit shorter. But that's what uh, serial depiction would look like. It allows you to connect with a lot of different people and... Uh, Uh-oh, technical difficulties have gotten the best of us. It looks like uh, Dr. Schmidt got uh, kicked out of the, uh, it looks like his internet connection uh, disconnected to him, disconnected him. So, uh, so, so Bill, let, 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 as we wait for Dr. Schmidt to reconnect, let's, uh, you and I, uh, take a moment here and just wrestle a little bit with some of the ideas that uh, he's thrown our way. Now, you're, you're, you're a very skilled preacher, and I have heard you use all three of the uh, strategies that Dr. Schmidt put out there in, in the first place. What would be some guidance you would offer preachers in using narrative to flesh out a particular challenge or opportunity in a, uh, um, in a particular preaching situation? Well, I think, I think the uh, challenge always is that the story overwhelms or uh, maybe takes you down a rabbit trail that you don't want it to go. Ah, he's back. Very he good. is back. Sorry about that. I forced you to take a break. <laughs> yeah, well, well played, sir. Uh, well, well played. That, uh, that is, uh, is definitely uh, it's the kind of thing that happens sometimes. Now, now Bill, you're just saying that, uh, uh, that one of the things that, that, that can sometimes you can wrestle with in a narrative form, and this actually sets up the very question that I want to ask you, Dr. Schmidt, in the, uh, um, in the Q&A time is uh, sometimes the details of a particular story can take you down a rabbit trail. So uh, uh, anything yeah, else so, you'd add to that, Bill? Yeah, so, uh, and, and, it's, and I, th I think it's, it's always neat to me where someone way smarter than me uh, kind of lays out some of the reasoning behind why we do what we do. Hmm. Uh, so, so my neck of the woods here in West Houston is a lot of engineers, and, you know, it's an oil and gas. And... Uh, what I always encourage our guys when we're prepping to preach is the phrase, uh, and it's, gosh, it was like eerie when you said it, but it's uh, make make it sense. So I want it to make sense, and I want it to make me feel. Uh, you said make me care. So, right, so I, it has to make sense to me, so our guys are very logical. You know, you can't give me some straw man and knock him down. That doesn't work. Uh, and, and the whole reality of life needs to be front and center. Uh, but I think that when you go to tell the story, like you said, you know, you, you actually told the story about the woman at the well, but you also told the narrative about uh, about the, uh, 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 the the couple with the Down syndrome child. Uh, I always remember Paul Harvey, uh, so I'm kind of dating myself a little bit. Sure. But but he always saved the ending of the story, right? And so uh, I, when I when I go to use narrative, I like to like hold back 
something uh, a little bit towards the end, you know, so that you're actually waiting with me to see. And uh, but uh, but I love I love your point of saying that the that the climax of the story uh, needs to be what what changes me there in the story is the point of the message. And I think that's a, that's a beautiful spot on point because that's where we go astray a lot. I think. Yeah, I would agree. I think that's a that's a great insight as well, as well, Bill, to uh, to to wrestle through. Now, the vast majority of the questions that we're getting uh, on Twitter, either with the hashtag five two live or in the uh, Q and A area here inside the Google Hangout, have to do with preparation to use these uh, various approaches to uh, to focusing the sermon. So, uh, Dr. Schmidt. Let, let's start in the narrative uh, narrative approach. How do you choose the right details to include in the conversation? Well, you yeah, you have to know your point number one, <laughs> right? So if you don't know the point you're telling, the reason you're telling the story, then you can't tell the story yeah. because you you have no clue where you're taking people or what you're desiring them to understand. So knowing what your point is, then at least helps you filter out what might distract them. Now, um, you're, not, you're not implying that there are preachers out there that don't know their point, are you? <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think what happens is um, because the stories that we have are real mm -hmm. and we, we desire to convey how powerful they are for us, but in order to con we think that in order to make them powerful, we have to include all of these details from our life that made them powerful for us, and that's where we start going down the rabbit hole. Okay. And I think sometimes you can actually convey the power of a story not by details. Uh oh. As you talk about it, so. They will empathize with you, okay. and if they see your emotion, then the story can become powerful. Okay, so, so how many details are too many details when you're when you're using this kind of approach? Um, I, I, I think it's it's rather uh, are there details that don't relate to the point you're trying to make? Okay, right. So. Um, early with the, the story of Bill and Janelle, I talked about how they uh, they lived a life that people called free spirited. They were not married. Um, I could have given you what they did for a living, but that really has nothing to do with my topic of hope. Mm. My topic of hope does deal with a way of life. So they have a way of life that's free spirit. It's going to be called hope later, and it does have to do with the fact that they entered into a process of seeking to be married. So I gave you that detail about their life earlier. So it's just a matter of saying, what's my main point, and how do these details help that? Otherwise, you're giving people stuff. It's kind of like, here, look at this. Oh, by the way, that has nothing to do with my point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why would you do that? Right? Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. How about um, how do you decide what method of development to use in a particular message? That's a question from Justin. In, uh, in Ann Arbor. Now that's a very good question. Uh, thank you, Justin. Glad you're here. <laughs> uh, the, uh, for me, one factor is the rest of the sermon. So I think all of us have certain methods of development that come naturally to us. Some guys are, are natural storytellers. Other guys work with images. Other guys love to explain things. And for me, uh, if you do one of these methods all the way through the sermon, it's, it sounds like you're saying the same thing all of the time to the people because it's the exact same methodology all the way through the sermon. And so it, even though you're saying different things, it just sounds the same. So you want variation. So uh, part of the issue is if I've, if I've got an image, I would ask myself, well, have I used an image elsewhere in the sermon? If not... Mm -hmm. Have I been doing explanation? Well, then I probably won't, won't want to do that. Uh, so on one thing, it deals holistically with what's the rest of the sermon like. Um, individually, it also deals with which one of these best does this point for my people. Because some of them, you know, depending on what your point is, some of them are going to work better than another. All right. That's a, that's a great set of insights. Now, here's a question from, from Benjamin Francisco wanting to know, well, he says, are there any cues in the text or texts that are being used that lead you to choose one method over the other? I'm going to rephrase that a little bit. 
what cues in, in a particular text might point you toward a particular method as opposed to m might help you make the choice of which particular method to watch for? Well, yeah. Um, for me, it's not so much based on the text as it is uh, based on who my people are and what the teaching is that I'm trying to communicate. Because, you know, this methodology, it, it can be used for, for any teaching, and it can be used for teachings that, you know, are um, from our culture that are not related to Scripture at all. So it's really a matter of um, which way best approaches it. But I would say some texts are going to be filled with images. Poetic texts are going to be filled with images. So usually if I'm working with a prophetic text, a psalm, uh, I'll find myself working with images in a sermon. Uh, other texts will carry a narrative for you or offer you a narrative. But I'm, a, I, I'm not a fan of, of always matching the text and the method of development because uh, some people learn better by narrative, others learn by explanation. So if we've got a narrative text, maybe it's helpful to explain things for people. If we've got an explanatory text from Paul, it's nice to include narrative. So we've got complementary methods of learning rather than everything being the same. All right, that that's a great set of insight. Now, before we go back to the uh, to the rest of of Dr. Schmidt's content to this afternoon, I do want to remind you that if you have a question like uh, Benjamin Francisco's did just there, you Benjamin Francisco did just there, you can put them in the Q and A app as a part of the uh, Google Hangout. If you look on the uh, on the left hand side of your screen, there's a little thought bubble or conversation bubble that says Q and A. Open that up. You'll have a chance to put your question in directly and uh, we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Or you can tweet them out using the hashtag 52Live. Please spell it just like you see on your screen right now, because if you don't, uh, we might miss it. Well, then I would hate to miss the opportunity of uh, to answer your particular question. So uh, several more methods to go. Dr. Schmidt, uh, why don't you uh, continue with us? Another method would be image, and so here's what that might sound like. Uh, years ago, I uh, bought a... Uh, a uh, movie, a uh, DVD of a movie that I'll, I'll probably never watch completely again. Uh, it was Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. Uh, the movie for me was a little bit too violent uh, and graphic in the depiction of the Passion, so much so that I don't think I'll ever watch the whole movie again. But I bought that DVD because there was one scene, one scene in that movie that just played in my mind again and again after I watched that movie. And it's the scene where Jesus is on his way to the cross, his face is bloodied and beaten, and he's interacting with Mary after the third time that he has fallen. If you remember that scene, uh, Jesus is traveling through the streets of Jerusalem carrying his cross. Mary sees him fall, and she reaches out to catch him. Uh, her mind goes back to the past, and she remembers him as a child running and falling, and she reaches out for Jesus, and in that moment, uh, you watch as Jesus reaches out and catches her with a word. You have this picture where his face is bruised and beaten. He looks at her and he says to her, Behold, I make all things new. Mm. Mary's mind is filled with images of the past and Jesus gives her a glimpse of the future. Mary's mind is uh, breaking over the end, and Jesus promises her a new beginning. Mary is filled with images of death, and he, Jesus offers her an image of life. And that moment captures something that I believe Christ does for all of us in our lives of faith. Moments when we are carrying our cross and facing suffering, our Lord promises that he makes all things new. Because there's a way of life called hope. It's uh, a, a way of life that God's given us. We don't confuse it, and then you just go through and say that whole thing again. So that's a, an example of using an image as a way to communicate a teaching. If you look at that sheet, I'm um, going to try to not lose you. Uh, the, uh, the methodology of imagery. When you're working with image, remember you're working with a moment in time. So although there's always going to be a story, the story lies in the background. What you're trying to capture is that one moment when everything becomes clear. So in this case, you have the story of Jesus traveling to the crucifixion, but the real moment I want to capture is that moment when Jesus 
is facing Mary and speaks to her with a word of hope. And so you'll notice how I privileged that moment in the way I related this development. I started to tell the story, but I gave you that scene up front. Then I took you into the story and returned to the scene. Once again, you want to use concrete details to help people visualize what is happening. Uh, so I gave you the language of the bloody face of Jesus, his looking in the eyes of Mary. And you also want to be aware of poetic language. Uh, so I played a little bit with the idea of Jesus falling and Mary trying to catch him, and now Jesus catching her with a word. And I worked with the contrast of what Mary was seeing and what Jesus was doing. Uh, that's the way in which you can play with image as a, as a method for developing an I idea for the hearers. So in addition to image, uh, a fourth method would be a method that we could call dialogue. Now in this case, you can actually engage in conversation with members in the congregation. It doesn't have to be that way. You can imagine a dialogue or tell a story that has dialogue yourself, but I would invite you to actually think about conversing with members in your congregation. Here's what that might sound like, uh, kind of in an imaginary scenario. There's a way of life called hope. God has given it that name. Don't confuse it with what some call anticipation or dreaming or others positive thinking. No, there's a way of life called hope. It's when a promise of God about our future changes the way that we live now. I've invited Marjorie to talk to you this morning. Uh, if you remember, uh, Marjorie's mother, Gertrude, died about five years ago, and a lot of you gathered for the funeral here. Marjorie called this week. She wanted to put all flowers on the altar for Gertrude's funeral. And we got to talking, and as we talked, we talked about that funeral and what it was like. And Marjorie told me uh, how important her faith was during that time, how the, the, the message of the resurrection of our Lord brought her through a very difficult, a very difficult time. And so I've invited Marjorie to, to just kind of talk with me about that experience and to share it with you. Um, I uh, altar flowers on the altar, lest you be involved in a sermon. I'm sure Marjorie is nervous, but I, I'm really thankful she has agreed to, to talk. At this point, you invite Marjorie forward, or she's sitting in the pew, and you chat with her about the resurrection and her experience uh, during that time. And then, after that conversation, you move to a, uh, an explanation of the Christian teaching about hope and how Paul teaches us that uh, we do not grieve as others grieve, and uh, we, we live in hope. I'm not sure if I'm still connected or not. Am I still connected? You're, you're connected on my end, David, yes. Okay, great, great. So that would be what a, a moment of dialogue would look like. And I'll kind of have a kind of have a testimony, and uh, in, in, you know maybe not the term that we we are comfortable using, and yet uh, you're you're going to kind of go live and let people see the real life instance of this hope application. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, you know, I can tell you the story, or I can show you the story, right? So uh, right, and you're and you're actually giving your people the opportunity to talk about their faith. That's right. That's They're, right modeling how they talk about faith with one another, they're hearing it from one another. Um, you can have a, a bit of conversation where you have the people actually talk with one another in a group and then you summarize it as the pastor afterwards, but um, yeah, there's a conversation can go along a whole spectrum from you reporting it to you actually engaging in it. Uh, if you had a, let's say you had a mission trip, youth went down to Mexico, did some mission work, came back, uh, you might invite one of those members up and just kind of uh, interview them for a longer period in the sermon. That would be that would be a, a moment of dialogue. Okay. And when you're um, thinking about dialogue, the uh, things to keep in mind. Uh, this is going to be working with conversational speech. What I like about dialogue is that people get to hear what your Christian teaching sounds like in real life. A lot of times we have our theological language that we use, or we've uh, made our language beautiful in a way, and people get the idea, but they say, well, that, you know, that would never happen in my life, or that's not what, I, I don't see that happening in my life. In this case, 
because the speech is very conversational, it's almost as if they're overhearing and they're thinking, wow, I've actually said that or I've heard somebody say that. So it, it captures real life and brings theology to life for people. Uh, we had mentioned the dialogical situation. I had... Uh, what I mean by that is it, uh, it could be you as a pastor, it could be you as the preacher with another person, it could be you creating a situation where members talk with one another and then report back to the group. Uh, many different situations could be used uh, in this particular methodology. Uh, as you're thinking about how that, that, that moment progresses, sometimes I think your dialogue can move from conflict to clarity. That is, you start with a problem and then through conversation lead people to seeing a resolution. Other times, like with this case with Marjorie, we're really starting at a place of agreement. We, we all know that the resurrection of Christ gives us hope in time of grief, but what our dialogue is going to do is it's going to move us deeper into reflecting on that teaching that we know. Hmm. And uh, sometimes a dialogue can act telling a story. A story can want to dialogue when you have this uh, debate that's going on between characters in the story and then one climactic pronouncement that carries the, carries the main meaning of that section. So that would be the, the method that we call dialogue. In addition to dialogue, there's another method which would be called enactment. And in this one, you as a preacher have actually thought of an activity that God's people will do that will bring the topic home to them. So in this particular case, I'll describe the activity that we could possibly do. I'll, I, I would start by saying there's a way of life called hope. And then I would talk about how hope arises from promises of God that we hold God to in prayer. And at this point, I'll then have a, a listing in the worship folder or on a screen of promises from Scripture, promises of God, that are pretty clearly stated for people. So, lo, I am with you always to the end of the age, um, something like that. Have a list of promises. I'll ask the members to meditate on those promises, choose one that's important to them, and then think about why it's important to them and why they would like someone to hold God to that promise in prayer for their life. After they've done that, they will then share that promise with someone sitting next to them. If they're uncomfortable with that, I'll have elders or I'll have members of the congregation who volunteer to see people who have raised their hand. They'll go and they will engage in prayer. Uh, they will name whatever situation it is they're bringing to God, and in hope, they will say a prayer that's naming God's promise and asking that God will work this promise in their life. So in this case, you're actually putting the teaching into action. Rather than telling them about a way of life called hope, I'm actually enabling them to live in that way of life called hope by praying for one another according to the promises of God. So back to the, uh, to the handout. When you're working with an actment, uh, the big thing is, is that this is an active learning event. There are things that people are doing. They could be singing a hymn. They could be praying with one another. They could be writing something down. There's something that they are doing, which is putting this teaching into action for them. Uh, you want to make sure that the event has clarity to it, that they recognize that whatever it is that they are doing uh, relates to the main idea. So as I'm setting up this event for praying in hope, I might use that language of praying in hope so that they recognize this is one way we live in hope is through prayer. And then there is a matter of contextualization. You really have to know who your people are. I know there are some uh, worshiping communities where something like this is going to seem foreign to them. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be nervous about interacting with people with, in this way. And so if that's the case, then you don't do this uh, for them. You don't want to ever put people into an awkward situation as you're trying to develop an idea for them. So be aware of your context, what's going to work for them, what might not work for them. Um, but it is a method of development that's, uh, that's possible for you to use in preaching. Then we have one last one, and then I'll be done, okay? 
The last one would be explanation. I put it last because it's one of the ones that people use most frequently and they don't think about the others. And this is simply where you use rational explanation to communicate your idea to your people. Uh, there's value to it. It's a teaching moment in the sermon. Too much of it can turn a sermon into a lecture and uh, that may not always be the most helpful thing for your people. If we're working with explanation or a way of life called hope, uh, let's say I have Psalm 71 as our text. Uh, here we have a psalm where the writer uh, is uh, suffering under weakness. He's surrounded by enemies. And even though he knows his weakness, he knows his strength. His strength is the Lord whom he calls his hope. And so I could explain to people what it means that the Lord is his hope in this psalm. And I could show you how in the psalm, uh, hope recalls. It recalls the things that God has done in the past. And hope rejoices. It rejoices in the promises that God has for the present. And it also relates. It relates these things to others. And I could take you to particular points in the psalm where the psalmist is recalling the past, he's rejoicing in the power of God, and he's relating this to people in the future. So I've summarized the psalm, I've explained it as a way of trying to help you understand uh, a way of life called hope. And when you think about uh, the method of, of, of explanation as a method of development in preaching, you're going to be using reason and explanation. Uh, so I would say you want to make sure that what you're saying is clear. Uh, that it makes sense, that it communicates to people. Uh, you don't want to assume that people understand. You kind of want to fully flesh it out for them. So if I'm working with a psalm and I'm telling you that the psalmist is rejoicing in the power of God, I'm going to want to quote the verse, read the verse, have the congregation read the verse with me, and then explain why this is joy so it's clear for them. And you also want some kind of logical organization. I've listed logical organizations for you on that sheet. It helps people follow. In this particular case, I used the, the logic of cause and effect. I, I showed you three effects of the Lord being your hope. Uh, that it, it, uh, when the Lord is your hope, you recall his work in the past, you rejoice in his power for the present, and you relate his works to others. And using uh, recall, rejoice, relate, you know, the alliteration may be one way of helping people uh, remember this. Okay, so that's the last of the uh, the last of the methods. All right, some 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 great thoughts, some great uh, challenges for us as uh, as communicators of the good news of the gospel. A couple of questions that have come in. Um, well, this one came in on, on the Twitter feed. Good. What do you see as the biggest challenge facing preachers today? Um, well, I think there's a lot of big challenges. Uh, the one that is that is related to the topic we're talking about is uh, attention span, right? So uh, neurological research has indicated that the uh, use of digital media is shortening the is is hindering the ability of people to reflect deeply mm -hmm. on a single idea. They've actually kind of researched this, and there are people who will they say self interrupt. So they may be working on something, and even though their phone doesn't ring, they'll check their phone simply because it's hard for them to stay focused for a long period of time. I think that's probably one of the big challenges, which is why, for me, um, having different ways of developing ideas in the sermon is important. It gives a sort of texture, makes it feel like you're doing different things rather than focusing on one thing all the way through. Okay, so I have to ask the, the question that is on everyone's the tip of everyone's tongue right now. Yeah. How long should a sermon be? to have maximum potential for impact in the congregation's life. life. Well, you know, I like um, to answer questions of length by asking us to think about connection. Okay. If you're talking about something that matters to my life, I'll listen to you. And okay. I can listen to you for an hour. If I have, a, if I have a, a mother who's entering into Alzheimer's and I'm not sure what to do in my life and you're going to tell me five things that I can do, I'm going to listen to you. And you could talk for an hour and I'll listen to you. 
But if you're talking about something that I don't care about, that doesn't connect to my life, well, you know, Amen. there is no answer to the amount of time. So I think the, the issue is rather than thinking about how long is my sermon, ask yourself, am I really connected? Mm. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent reorientation around uh, what really makes, sets the stage, sets the foundation for impact in a particular sermon. Now, Bill Wolsey, I know that, uh, that, that there's something else brewing in your mind. What's your question for Dr. Schmidt? Well, I just I want to say that was a profound uh, last statement that he made. Mm -hmm. uh, in essence, that if I don't care about what you're saying, uh, I'll tune you out in 15 seconds, let alone 15 minutes or 50 minutes. And I do think that is the there, there's a challenge for us, right, in preaching the law in such a way that that says to the listener, I know you. I know you, I've been you, I am you, I've walked with you. But then to also bring in Jesus in such a way that says, I know Jesus, I've walked with Jesus, I've been with Jesus, and let me introduce you to him because he's what's gonna he's gonna help you make sense of the of the law mess that you're in. Uh, and and I think that uh that was just very profound. If I don't care, if if it doesn't have any relation to me. So, you know, the, the takeaway for me there is I better know the people that right. I've been called to preach to. Uh, one of the things I learned way back when is that, that uh, to stay engaged through counseling of parishioners. Uh, I may not be the best counselor, and I certainly don't, don't go very long with you before I, my, I might refer you out. But if I'm not engaged in listening and, and working with you in your life, it's very hard for me to, to uh, communicate in a way that, that that brings that law to bear. So mm -hmm. I don't know. That's that's a. I think you you know your your question earlier of of what it is that that is the challenge uh, to people your your connectivity you're keeping them engaged in that message. Uh, I've seen people who preach a long time and I like you said I would sit there and listen. So I think that connectivity uh, is really the overarching issue for us right now. So so how do you, how do you develop that? that connection with the congregation, with the person who's listening? Well, I think it's partly developed uh, not in the sermon, inside the sermon, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you, 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 you build relationships with people. And in those relationships, I know that you care. And mm. now, you know, when I listen to you talk about how, you know, God will never leave us alone, I... I remember you sitting in my house when my husband left me. And I think, yeah, you're right. But if, if I haven't had those relationships, then, you know, you're, you're just kind of, uh, you're setting yourself up for a, a fall. <laughs> because, because, you know, you can be talking about stuff, but it doesn't, it doesn't relate to life. So I think part of it is outside of the sermon, that, that issue. I think the other is, um, is, yourself being transparent that you care about these things. Uh, I think the um, one of the, the arcs of growth as a preacher that I often see is uh, beginning preachers are very emotive and engaged and powerful when they're talking about personal life stories. Uh, but when they talk about scripture or Jesus, it's not as powerful. And, and my goal and my prayer for all preachers is that when they talk about Jesus, it would be just as interesting as when they talk about themselves. Wow. Mm -hmm. Kind of that Second Corinthians 5, right? The love of Christ compels us. You know, it, it uh, right. throws us out there. And, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's very, very well said as mm -hmm. well. I, it, it, when I when I talk about Jesus, uh, and you can see that it's that Acts chapter four, right? You know, unschooled ordinary men, but they've been with Jesus. When right. you can see that, not in a braggadocious way, but in a just everyday, real kind of way, that's that's wonderful. Very very well yeah. said. Very uh, well yeah, said. I, I agree. I agree. All right, last thought. Uh, we'll wrap up after this uh, particular question. What methods of development are most readily deployed with multimedia or social media in connection with them? So what would be your guidance to preachers looking to have even more media beyond the initial conversation? 
Yeah, well, I think the um, I think the methods of development would be the uh, the dialogue method because the uh, social media gives you the ability to have texting and feedback uh, either at specific portions in the sermon or throughout the sermon uh, and image because the media gives you the ability to uh, actually visually display things, uh, show movie clips. So I think uh, image and the uh, dialogue are the are the two. Uh, with the um, with the social with the dialogue one, I, I I would say one particular caution I've always given is is if you're working with text messages that bring up an issue, um, you you really have to be careful because you don't want to shame people uh, in terms of what they're saying, and we all know that the life experience that lies behind the Question shapes the way you ask me uh, what happened. Ask me about a certain sin. It depends on are you someone who's committed that sin or are you mm -hmm. someone who's angry that someone else has committed the sin. So it shapes how I answer. So what I would usually do if I had a text question, um, I would try to create an imaginary situation that lies behind that question. And so I would say, well, you know, here's our question about this. Some people wonder about this when, tell a minor story that creates a situation and then answer it. Because now my act as a pastor is happening in relationship. It's not the, uh, you know, the theologian answer man who you throw a question to me and I'll give you a, you know, a technical teaching from the Bible that answers it. It actually is embodied in relationship, but it has to be an imagined one because the media itself is distancing people from me. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Dr. David Schmidt teaches at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. He will be a part of the 5-2 Wiki track uh, on preaching next week at uh, Wiki 14. Definitely looking forward to, uh, to getting to spend a little bit more time uh, benefiting from your insight and wisdom. Dr. Schmidt, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thank you. You bet. Now, Bill Wolsey, on this uh, uh, wrap-up of the last network call before Wiki, in just a few days before we all converge on Katy, Texas, what would be your final thought in this month's All Network call? I think what I heard really clearly from uh, Dr. Schmidt was this word presence, and it, it kind of went all throughout his presentation. And uh, I, I was just very thankful as, you know, as we talk about sacramental and this presence of Christ and how we have this mysterious a mythical in a, in a Tolkien kind of way uh, presence of Christ in the sacraments but also in us right uh, it's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me I just really appreciated hearing that that presence and preaching that being in the world of the listener and the world of Jesus and bridging that gap between them so uh, again uh, Dr. Schmidt thank you very very much I look forward to meeting you face to face for the first time uh, in, in person down in Katy, Texas next week. And to the rest of you, thank you for being on this call. For those of you who are going to watch the call after we post it, uh, I know you'll be as blessed as I am, as Jonathan uh, was during this time. Hopefully, we'll see you at Wiki next week. And if not, we hope to see you one of the locals around the country over the next few months. All right, so that puts a wrap on uh, this month's Wiki Call. I do want to just give you a little bit of a tease here. Bill mentioned that there's an ebook that will be available during the 5-2 Wiki Conference. This is what it is. Can you read what that says? Seven steps to start. Look down here at the author's name. Oh, it's washed out here on my, uh, on my iPad. It's by one Bill Woolsey. So that's something to, uh, to look forward to as a part of the 5-2 Wiki Conference next week. And don't worry if you're not going to be at the Wiki Conference. Well, we'll miss you first of all, but secondly, if you're not going to be at the Wiki Conference, there will be opportunities for you to get a copy of that particular ebook uh, through other channels after the Wiki Conference is over. So I'm going to offer a word of prayer, then we'll wrap up the September All Network Call, and we'll see you next week at Wiki, or in a month from now in the uh, next All Network Call from 5-2. So let's go to the Lord. Jesus, we just say thank you for the wisdom and insight that Dr. Schmidt shared with us. Uh, we, we ask you to cement this new knowledge in our hearts and in our minds so that preaching becomes even more effective. The whole goal of 5-2, uh, of, 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 of preaching, of, of, um, of many of the things we do is to draw 
people to you who don't know you already. And I just ask that you make that happen. Do things that only you can have done, could have done, and uh, make possible things that seem impossible to us because that's the thing that you do, one of the things that you do. We offer this all for your glory and your purposes, and we pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jonathan. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next Thanks, month. David. <clears throat>